Well, good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you. Um, perspectives. My sister sent me a story this week which I thought was worthy of repeating. A man was walking along the street and he passed a house and outside the house was this sign. It said, talking dog for sale. So he rang the doorbell and the owner answered him and told him that a dog could be viewed in the back garden. So he went round and looked and in the garden was sitting this lovely looking Labrador dog, well groomed, well fed. And he said, do you really talk? And the dog said, yep. And the bloke was amazed and after he recovered from the shock of a talking dog, he said, um, tell me your story. And the Labrador looked at me and said, well, I discovered I could talk when I was young. And I wanted to be of use, so my, so my owner loaned me to the government who put me to work with the Secret Service. Before long, I was flying all over the world and I was sitting in rooms with all sorts of world leaders and spies because no one realised that a dog would be eavesdropping on their conversation. I was one of the country's most valuable spies for eight years. But jetting around the world really tired me out. So I knew I wasn't getting any younger, so I asked if I could settle down. And I got a job at Heathrow Airport, um, and I was there with the security, and I did a lot of undercover work, sat by people, got their conversation, I uncovered some terrible things that were going on, and I actually got plenty of awards and a few medals for that. I then got married, and we had a few pups, and I've settled down, and now I'm retired. Well, the guy was absolutely amazed at this, and he thought, well, I'm going to find out about this. So he went to see the owner of the dog, and he said, so how much do you want from this dog? He said, oh, 10 pounds. He said, a tenner, 10 quid for that. That dog is absolutely amazing. Why would you sell him so cheaply? He said, because he's a compulsive liar. He's never been out of the back garden. <laughs> <laughs> a brilliant story, and perspectives. Love them, don't you? You know, perspective is so very important because there are many things to offer us a distraction in our world, and some things vie for our allegiance. So, for example, let me just show you some pictures. Right, does everyone know who this guy is? He was on the news a couple of weeks ago. Liam Payne, he, yeah, and then the next guy, next guy, yeah, General Sir Mike Jackson. Now, General Sir Mike Jackson, what an amazing guy. Uh, I don't know if you've read his book at all, but he was really, really good guy. Um, he led the army during the invasion of Iraq in 2003. He'd also worked with NATO, and he became famous during that conflict um, in Pristina in 1999 when he famously refused his American superior, um, that for, he said he wouldn't engage the Russian troops at the airport. And his words were, Sir, I'm not going to start World War III for you. And he was a soldier's soldier. He was respected and a buyer for his conscientious leadership. He had a fierce intellect, and he was really straight-talking, and he'll be sorely missed. And he was a real soldier, soldier, you know, and there, I was reading an article the other day about him um, on LinkedIn, actually, one of the officers, who was one of his junior staff officers, and he said he got a bawling out from Mike Jackson, and it went on for 20 minutes. So, you know, this is the kind of guy he was. The other guy was a guy called Liam Payne, who was in the pop, pop group um, One Direction. Okay, I had to look it up, okay. Um, <laughs> Apparently the group, the group broke up and he then um, launched a career of his own. And I didn't realise this, but he became one of the biggest pop stars in the world. Um, and after, after that, he struggled sadly with fame and fortune and then he fell to his death just recently. And the sad news was on the news report and there was this film of his father visiting the site of where the lad had died. Um, he looked at some of the tributes that were being laid by the many, many fans that had turned up, and I thought it was really kind of him. He actually engaged with the fans. I, I thought it was lovely to do that. And what's interesting, though, to me about these two news stories is that the cult of celebrity has dominated the news. You know, 
this, this whole celebrity thing, the fact that this famous young man has died, as sad as that is, and yet hardly anything was said about a man who devoted his life to the service of his country. Now, that's not a judgment, that's just an opinion and an observation for you. You see, because all life is precious, I really understand that. But clearly, reactions to these two deaths actually belies the fact that our society has bought into that which is pink and fluffy in its decision not to think about the bigger pictures of life. And the questions then that are posed to me, certainly to me as a Christian, is if this is true, then how does that reflect on the world's response to the gospel? How important is this message that we've got? Is it vital? You know, I had a lovely story this week of a little seven-year-old who came to his dad and said, Dad, I've worked out the meaning of the Bible. And he said, oh, really? What does it mean? He said, basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> it was really, really good. But then also I read about an astronaut who told how he saw Earth from, for the first time from space. And he said this, with the naked eye, we could see motorways and airports and cities, we could see white clouds, we could see snow on the mountains, we could see the green and brown patchwork of the farmer's fields, and we could see the beautifully painted deserts. And when we were over Chicago, we could see most of Hudson Bay, and at the same time we could see Washington, D.C., we could see Baltimore, and we could see two-thirds of the way down the Mississippi River and out to Denver. Now, I think it's intriguing, actually, to hear about his out-of-world view with all of its range, being able to define all those things, the mountains, the rivers, the cities, and even the intricate detail of motorways and fields and airports. And I would love to do that. Wouldn't you love to do that? I'd love to go in orbit. I'd like to be the first Baptist minister in orbit. I've, I've won that's why I wanted to appear on Star Trek, because I wanted to be the first Baptist minister on the Starship Enterprise. Could you imagine it? Revival on the Starship Enterprise. There's a, a theme for a series, isn't it? Now, take a moment, though, to think about God's perspective. This is God we're talking about. He's outside of time and space and history, and yet he is still intimately involved in his creation. And that kind of dwarfs any kind of description that we can have, whether that's from Earth or whether it's from space. Now consider then how liberating it would be if only you and I could see all, the, all of life and all the possibilities from God's perspective. See, the truth, look, the truth is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is capable of giving us not only a powerful, liberating view of life, but also a unique perspective on living, on setting standards, on offering a structure for behaviour so that our guilt can be dealt with, so that sinful behaviour can be corrected. And the hope beyond the hopelessness that prevails in our world and society that so many are lost to, a rescue can be offered. All of this is a reality because with the eye of faith, we as God's children, filled with the Holy Spirit, have the ability to see and gain a perspective from the vantage point of heaven. If only we will make our hearts and minds available to the divine. I think that's pretty high on the wow factor, doesn't it? When you think of who you are and your limited view of your life and the world, and yet God is offering you more and more and more and more, if only we will give our life to him. Well, let me give you a first heading. The perspective of a seeing heart. Over in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. You see, humanity has a tendency to look at life from a negative viewpoint. Not so for the Christian. In fact, a man called Michael Doris said this, being positive is part of being a hero. Maybe the hardest part. 
Because if you were a hero, you're smart enough to know all the reasons why you shouldn't be encouraged. For this reason, says Paul in chapter 3, I, Paul, the servant of Christ Jesus. And just those few words at the beginning of this passage this morning is an illustration and a true perspective from the vantage point of heaven. Here he is, sitting in prison, writing a letter, under the constraint of Roman law, as terrible as that could be, and yet Paul didn't see his captivity. He, saw a, he draws a comparison explaining that he is the prisoner of Christ, meaning that he's so taken up with Jesus in the way that he thinks and acts, and because of the hope and the promise of the salvation and eternity that he's already experiencing, even a prison cell can't hold him because he's free in his heart. And this is even more than just rising above the difficulties of life. This is liberty in the cold reality of daily living. You see, he not only understood what it meant to be in prison, he also understood the enslaving effects of our pride, of our legalism, of our self-righteousness, of our self-deception. But because he had been captivated by Jesus, he has discovered the liberating power of the gospel. This is fantastic stuff when you think about it. Liberation from his sin had transformed his entire outlook and approach to life. And here's the teaching, and I want you to hold on to these things. The only way to be released from the tension and the pressures of life's tough times is to know that we are not prisoners of our debilitating services, of circumstances. We're not prisoners of fate. And we're not prisoners of other people. And many of us here are familiar with the bully in various circumstances. As Christian believers, we are prisoners of Christ according to his unchanging, unqualified, gracious, liberating power. It's not good enough for us to ask the question, why did God let this happen to me? It's not good enough to say, why me? It's not good enough to say, why did I, I, what did I do to deserve this? I mean, we will ask those questions, of course. But what God wants for us is to experience the same perspective as that of Paul. He doesn't want us just to be looking for a silver lining. He wants us to understand that there's a purpose for everything that we experience in life. And although the pain at some times just seems so much harder to bear, we live in the knowledge that God is in control of our lives. Flick over a few pages to Philippians chapter 1 with me for a minute. Just to see these demonstrated. Look at this. Chap Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, of course, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole Pontius Guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. See what's happening to him? And then just go over to chapter 4. Look at chapter 4, verse 10. This is just enlightened. Look at this. I re and verse 10 in chapter 4. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul's focus, you see, is not on the immediate circumstances and what's in front of him, but on the purposes and the future of the circumstances that he's in. He understands that his life is much more than him. 
And we have to understand, do you remember this picture, I keep drawing with you, of that great lake. Do you remember that great lake? And then someone throws a rock in the lake and suddenly there's all these ripples. And that's exactly how our life goes on. It's actually a good Eastern way of viewing things. Everything we do, all that we are, has an effect on other people. But our problem is we are so focused on what's in front of us that we don't see what is beyond. And that is the nature of hope. You know the story, don't you, of the teenager who was learning to drive and he was weaving all over the road. Well, as a motorcyclist, I see a lot of motorists doing that. But, but they were all over the road like this. And in the end, the instructor pulls him over and he said, right, listen, you are never going to steer a straight course until you start looking further down the road. Have we all been there in our lessons? Yeah, you know what it's like, don't you? Because all you're thinking about is where the car's going. You're not thinking about what's ahead of you. Actually, most motorists do that from a motorcyclist perspective. Okay. Paul's enlightened heart, you see, allows him to see from the window of his prison cell the encouraging effects that his difficulties would have on his life and the lives of other people further down the road. He saw that these circumstances, although they were difficult, were good for him. They were for the benefit of other people. And so we should be taking that view as well, getting that bigger picture you were talking about. So that's the perspective of a seeing heart. But secondly, God's power for us who believe. In chapter 1 of Ephesians again, in verse 17, Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I love that. Get to know him better. That means we can always learn something more in this relationship. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was that the revelation of God might be given to them. And that is wisdom and understanding that is essential if this holy perspective is to be granted. But it means four things. Now, these four things, okay? And all these will be available for you. First of all, God's power comes to each of us if we allow him to change our perspective about our circumstances. So the story is told of this very wealthy industrialist who went on holiday in one of those nice island places, you know. And um, he went down to the quay and he saw a fisherman laying by his boat. And he was dumbfounded. But he thought, why is he not out fishing? So he went, um, what are you doing lazing there? Why aren't you fishing? And he goes, um, well, I've caught what I need for today. He said, why don't you go and catch more fish? So, well, then what do I do? He said, well, you could sell it and then you could actually buy a bigger boat and you could go and catch more fish and then you could end up with a fleet of boats and you could be rich like me. And then what would I do? He said, well, then you could sit back and enjoy life. And he smiled at him and said, what am I doing now? God's power comes to each of us as we allow him to change our perspective about our circumstances. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. I can hear my father. Secondly, God's power can come to each of us as we allow him to change our perception of people. I wonder what we're like when we look at people. Do we put limits on them so that we view them through the lens of our own limitations? Or do we see others and look in and see in them the great potential for greatness? You know, we had a friend. His name was Colin. In fact, our son is named after him. He was a successful financial consultant. Been in the army a long while, come out, set up business, was doing great. Um, and he succeeded because he saw everyone he, he met as a potential client. His wife, as a Christian, came to our church. Um, we were members of that church. And he came because he saw potential clients, you see. But Jesus had other ideas. And um, he trusted Jesus as his saviour. And he changed. 
And his view changed because he saw the congregation as his brothers and sisters in Christ. And he saw those who hadn't trusted Jesus yet as people who needed the power of Jesus in their life. He no longer viewed everyone as his walking retirement plan. We see people differently when the power of God, by his Holy Spirit, is released in our lives. Paul saw the Gentiles, those of us from a non-Jewish background, as the objects of God's love and part of God's plan. And so he rejoiced that he was imprisoned for Jesus Christ on our behalf. Thirdly, God's power comes to each of us as we allow him to change our perspective of ourselves. You know, the New Testament speaks of Christians with the, as followers, as laborers, as servants, as, as stewards, as soldiers, as ambassadors even. But each of those names implies that we're at the disposal of a superior. And for us, of course, that is our Father God. However, the effort to think and act like a Christian is a challenge to us to take seriously the sovereignty of God over the world that he has created. It's a challenge to take seriously the lordship of Christ over those he died to redeem. It's a challenge to take seriously the sustaining, enabling power of the Holy Spirit over our lives. And as we submit to his will and demonstrate this in our discipleship, and then humbly submitting to each other, there will be unity in the church. And this creates a pattern. And the pattern is this. The Spirit's power is released. And the church experiences the manifestation. And, when, and then the world sits up and listens. When the, when the Lord comes in, the world goes out. It's from this perspective that we are empowered to rise above the difficulties of life as we ask God and seek God to enable us to embody the principles of the gospel in our life. And it's at this point that we can see and understand that the gospel is the resurrecting power of God and that we are the people saved by that power. Fourthly, God's power comes to us when we allow his perspective to direct us at all times and not just in difficult circumstances. Isn't it interesting how difficult times in, in, improve your prayer life? Have you noticed that? Focusing on God is absolutely imperative. Growth comes as we rethink our concept of who we are. Focusing on God expands our vision of who we really are and what we are about. And this in turn opens our eyes to see the great opportunities that there are and the wonderful possibilities that there are for us to grow in grace and share our inheritance as the children of God with those who don't know him yet. So that, you see, that's perspective of a seeing heart. That's God's power for us who believe. Let's look at Paul's perspective of liberty, shall we? You know, it was Paul's perspective of what God was doing and what God could do through him that placed him in a position of service. That's why he was content. He prayed that our hearts might be enlightened so that we might know the hope of our calling in Christ. There's nothing more powerful than a God-given perspective for your life that enables you to see your hope in Christ. What does he say to the Romans? For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Here is the hope that enables us to remain optimistic and to be assured that there is nothing about us that God doesn't already know. The fact is, he is in control. Look with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's have a look at that. Corinthians chapter 10, 
and verse 13. This is a picture of God in control, this assurance of faith, understanding that there is nothing in our lives that God doesn't get. You know, sometimes we glory in that, don't we? We like, we like to be a mystery, don't we? Everyone likes to be mysterious. And yet God can read us like a book. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. When he spoke of his hardships in 2 Corinthians, don't look at that just now. He said, we are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It was Paul's perspective, you see, of what God was doing. It gave him this hope for the future. And as the gospel lifts us up to the heavenly places with Christ, we are enabled to see our life from God's perspective. And this alone is what reveals God's power to each of us and in each of us. Was it Jeremiah who said, for I know the plans that I have for you, come on, say it with me if you know it, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. No, Joe and I were talking just for the service, and we were talking about our mortality. We said, well, something's going to get you in the end. But why do we allow our mortality to drag us down? Why do we worry about living and dying when we've got hope in Christ? What are we worried about dying for? We're dead already, aren't we? You see, the search for a Christian perspective on life, it, it's not some academic exercise. Now, this is important for us to grasp because it's impossible for us to develop a, a correct... It's, sorry, it's, in, it's possible for us to develop a correct perspective and then be left powerless. Too much of our theology it leaves us thinking differently but doesn't really have any effect on how we live. But a true perspective, a Holy Spirit perspective, is what is important here because it opens our hearts and minds to the presence of God and the availability of his help as we travel this road of pilgrimage. And as we experience God, we want more of God. Do you remember me telling you a story about my friend Bill White who experienced revival on a number of occasions and he said to me, brother, when you've experienced that, you don't want anything else. And if you've ever been in that privileged position of birthing a new Christian, you just don't want anything else. You want to see it more and more and more and more. It was because of this perspective that Paul saw that his prison was his pulpit and it was made possible by the power of God. The power of the good news of the gospel made Paul the prisoner of Jesus and not the prisoner of Caesar. Paul saw the hope of his calling because he saw, because he saw God's power redeeming the whole situation. He became imprisoned for the sake of those who were lost. Look at verse 7, chapter 3 of Ephesians. Verse 7. He says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I'm the less than the least of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles this boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past has been kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms 
according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a long sentence. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This had never been heard before. I ask you, therefore, do not be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. It's because of these things that you can now come into the presence of God. Be aware of this confidence that is yours because of what Jesus has done. That is the freedom I'm experiencing. I am in the presence of God, even in prison. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be in the presence of God. Just open your heart, open your mind, and open your eyes. Because if you don't, you'll just be blind and lost. So in conclusion, this kind of power that Paul prayed for us to discover, it's like the, the power that God exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead. And there's a dire need for the church to pray that God might open the eyes of our heart, that we might see and we might cooperate with the power of God. You see the relationship in that? And that is far above anything that any of us can ever imagine. And this can only happen if we gain spiritual wisdom and insight to our life, warts and all, from God's vantage point. Oh, there's a a view of honesty that we don't want to look at every day. And we have to realise that it's his power that will enable us to solve any issue that we might have. Give you another picture of perspective. You know, one church I was a pastor, and um, I took the deacons on retreat to Lindisfarne, Holy Island, and everyone was really excited. You know, we all got in the car. We met up at the appropriate time. Stuff went in the cars, and we had a great time driving down. A couple of cars, and when we went over the causeway at Holy Island, I don't know if you've been there, but it, the tide was out. We went over the causeway, and as you're going up, there's sand dunes on the left-hand side. And it was pitch black. There's no light pollution because it's in the national park. And I pulled the car over and we turned all the lights out. We got everyone and everyone sort of chattering and excited. And I just said to everyone, would everyone look up? And we saw the Milky Way. It was breathtaking. It was magnificent. I mean, glory, you know, glory comes to mind. You just... And, and the harder you look, the more you saw. And I think that's the amazing thing, isn't it? When you're stargazing, you think you can see it, but then you see further and further and further and further. And everyone went quiet. And then I, to start the retreat, I said, well, now we've got a perspective on the greatness of God. Let's begin. And I have to tell you, we had a fantastic retreat, but that's a story for another time. Just read these verses from Paul in chapter 3 again, the verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's people to begin to grasp just how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations forever and ever. Amen. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Let's pray together, shall we? We do pray, Lord, that you give us the perspective that Paul had and that liberty of living in your spirit. 
and realizing too the stewardship that you expect of us as we step out in faith to trust you more and more. We pray for ourselves individually that you would visit us anew and grant us that power and help us to see with a, a sight that we've never known before, to be honest about ourselves, honest about our worldview, and to be willing to open our eyes and to see more. And we pray for the church here at Bethel that we, all of us, might collectively grasp that vision together and see you at work and be willing to let you in so that the world in us might just leave the building and so that we might become a liberated people who respond to the needs of a lost world. We thank you, Lord, for your love that you lavish upon us. And we thank you that you regard us as your children, although we don't see ourselves as worthy. We thank you that you call us by name and we are yours. To help us this day, we pray to trust you that little bit more and help us to get to know you a bit better. For we ask it in Jesus' lovely name and for his glory alone. Amen. Thank you.